Stanford University. Feet uh, speak for uh, Tina Seelig in the back and myself, uh, who have been the faculty host of the seminar series this year. We uh, have enjoyed every minute of it, like I hope you have. Um, and we will be back in late September, if not early October, I don't remember exactly the date, for another 24 of these uh, in the coming year. Uh, but as you, as you well know, this is the Draper Fisher Jervison Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar Series uh, brought to you by uh, STVP, the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students, um, SCPD, the Stanford Center for Professional Development, and uh, probably a bunch of other <laughs> groups with nice acronyms like that <laughs> that I'm forgetting. So I broke my reading glasses today. Otherwise, I would have stood up here and sad for you, I would have read all about uh, to you, uh, Alex. So I'm just going to do this from memory. This guy is really special. He went to Northwestern. I know that. I remember that part much. Um, he was a part of Teach for America, which maybe some of you uh, students are thinking about, and I hope he'll talk a little bit about today because that is an incredible organization. He also started another organization called One Economy. I get that right? Uh, in 2000, that was highly successful. That I hope he'll talk about as well. But in the 0608 time frame, he was essentially President Obama's technology guru, and I got that right off of Wikipedia, so it must be true. Uh, where he pulled together uh, the, all the folks that were advising the then candidate Obama on his technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship agenda. Um, he has been, since early April of 2009, the special advisor uh, on innovation for Secretary Clinton in the State Department, which, if I got this right last year, just blow your mind. 65,000 employees, if I remember that number correctly. 65,000 employees. So we have one of them here, and we probably could find out where Secretary Clinton is today, so we know where two of you are today. Uh, so without further ado, let's make a special welcome to somebody who truly is an entrepreneurial thinker inside this administration, Alec Ross. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for coming out on a beautiful May afternoon in Palo Alto. For you all to come in and on a, a May afternoon in Palo Alto, I think, is, is, is humbling because I was wandering around campus before this and I had to coax myself to, to, come, to go back to work. Um, it's, it's exciting to be able to, to speak with you all this afternoon. When I was asked to, to give this talk by Tom Byers, he said, think about the advice that you'd like to give to the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs. And, and for me, that was sort of an irresistible offer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about you know, my own personal story and, and some of what I did going into government and, and some of what I'm now doing in, in public service. But I want to spend a bulk of time just sharing, sharing four lessons with you. Um, first, manage time like you manage your money. Two, hire true believers. Three, stay connected. And four, stay out of the gray twilight. I'll come back to those four later. But first I wanted to, to give a little bit of background about you know, my history as, a, as an entrepreneur outside of government and now inside government. As Tom Byers mentioned, uh, when I first got out of school, and the age of many of you, I became a middle school teacher in West Baltimore through a program called Teach for America. And at this point, this was the early 90s, and this was the pre-Internet Explorer, pre-broadband, pre-mass use of, of the Internet. And one of the things that I saw when I was teaching these middle schoolers in one of the poorest, most violent communities in America. This was a community that, at the height of the crack wars, um, was, was a virtual bat battlefield for these young people. Um, one of the things that I saw in my incredibly overcrowded classroom, I mean, this is a, this is a beautiful amphitheater that probably holds, you know, 100, 150 people. If, the, if there were this much space at Booker T. Washington Middle School where I was a teacher, they'd try to 
cram 500 students into it. So I had a little classroom uh, the size of your th about the size of your thumb where I taught you know, 37, 38 uh, middle school students who were, who were just jumping beans in terms of their interest to move around and get out of those little seats and be able to really connect and engage connect and engage educationally. And the one place where I saw those young people really be able to learn the way that they were supposed to learn as opposed to being stacked into a classroom and, and learning out of 30-year-old textbooks was when they used technology. And that, I saw it initially that one time during the week where we would march down to the computer lab um, for an hour a week. And one of the things that I saw with these young people in the computer lab and using technology to use self-paced learning was that there was something incredibly intuitive about the use of technology among that generation of young people. And you know, for those of you who are, who are seniors, in, uh, seniors in, in college now, MBA students, you, know, you probably would have been about the age of my, of my sixth graders then. And I thought, you know, as this was taking place again during the early 90s in a period of the massive deindustrialization of the economy, the loss of America's manufacturing base, a time at which people could no longer count on making a union wage job, working at a port, working at a mill, working at a factory. It was at this time that the American economy was basically splitting into two. On the one hand, increasingly technology-rich, knowledge-based jobs. On the other hand, instead of those good old jobs at the port, the mill, and the factory, people were having to go into service industry jobs. And more often than not, mom and dad having to take those service industry jobs, take not one but two of them, and four jobs then between a husband and a wife and not a health insurance plan between them. And so, you know, what I and, and some buddies saw at that time with the changing nature of the economy and sort of the rise of technology um, was that, hey, this was an opportunity for people from historically low-income and working-class communities to, to enter the economic mainstream. If it's the case that it doesn't matter how much money is in your wallet or how much melanin is in your skin, that the use of technology is incredibly intuitive regardless if you're a young person, then that's an asset that you could build on to help people enter the economic main street and compete and succeed in our technology-rich, knowledge-based economy. So after my history, as a, after my time as an inner city school teacher, I and three friends started a nonprofit in a basement uh, called One Economy. And you know, if I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have bothered starting it. And if I had, I would have been incredibly unsuccessful. So there was something about being a 20-something-year-old, naive, hopeful individual that allowed me and my colleagues to become successful. And I'll get to the why of that a little bit later. And we built that, that nonprofit with the mission to maximize the potential of technology to help people of low incomes enter the economic mainstream. And, and we grew up from being four people in a basement to the world's largest digital divide organization, eventually helping more than 20 million people in more than 10 countries on four continents use technology to get the skills that they needed to live better lives. And, you know, I did that for, for a period of you know, eight, nine, ten years. And, you know, one of the things that toward the end of that, that period that I saw was there was a, this extraordinary member of the United States Senate who his own personal and professional roots were in the south side of Chicago. And I saw in, in this man, Barack Obama, that he got it. He truly got how technology could be a difference maker uh, in, the lives, uh, in, in the lives of America's low income and working class communities. And so, you know, I was very fortunate, as Tom mentioned, to work, you know, amidst a great many people um, to help build a technology and innovation agenda for, for then Senator Obama's presidential campaign, which then 
propelled me into government service and what I'm doing now as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's Senior Advisor for Innovation. And to speak very briefly about what we're doing at the State Department, uh, first of all, we're having an enormous amount of fun. Um, one of the real gifts of public service for me is getting to work for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, she is a truly muscular Secretary of State. Um, she's very, very good at her job. And one of the things that she did upon becoming Secretary of State was create an innovation agenda for America's foreign policy. If you think about foreign policy, a lot of the time you might think about you know, the formal interactions between sovereign states as conducted by diplomats over mahogany tables with flags in the background. And one of the things that Hillary Clinton said was, yes, diplomacy oftentimes involves the formal interactions between sovereign states with the flag flying in the background. But what she said is that not all of our diplomacy needs to be conducted government to government. But by using the tools of the 21st century, we can now engage government to people, people to people, and people to government. How can we can connect and engage with the wider world in ways that we previously hadn't? And if you think for a moment about some of our recent um, political history, a lot of the people, and as I traveled around the world, um, I kept hearing the United States' foreign policy described as overpowering. The United States trying to overpower its interlocutors around the world. And one of the things about Secretary of State Clinton is that she is now very much focused on empowerment. Empowering versus overpowering. And technology for, for which I'm sure this is intuitive to you and for everybody else, you know, 20 miles north and south of here in Silicon Valley, everybody knows and understands the role that technology can play in empowerment. And so very few initiatives that we focused on using technology as something that can be empowering and can get people engaged in diplomacy and development in ways that weren't you know, the case historically. Uh, one example. Um, there was, in the hours after the earthquake in Haiti, um, there are these, these fantastic uh, women who work in the innovation space at the State Department, and they got the idea in the hours that followed the earthquake that, you know, hey, tomorrow morning when people wake up and are having their morning coffee and they've heard about what happened in Haiti, we should be able to do something so that those people hearing about this for the first time over that morning cup of coffee can do something right then. And so what they did is they worked with the private sector um, at the secretary's direction to, to immediately stand up a program so that people who text, texted the word Haiti uh, to a short code 90999 could donate $10 for earthquake relief. And at the time, we, we thought, you know, hey, maybe we'll raise a couple hundred thousand dollars if everything breaks right. You know, wow, we might be able to raise a million dollars, and that would be of a truly historic nature. And what happened was this campaign became viral over social media, over the Twitter sphere, in social media space, in other social media spaces. And once it became viral, in, in the days immediately after the campaign, in social media spaces, it was then adopted by the mainstream media. And eventually more than three million Americans chose to use their cell phones to make a $10 donation, and more than $30 million were, was raised for uh, earthquake relief in Haiti. Um, another example of the kind of 21st century statecraft that Secretary Clinton is, lead, is, is leading um, is an example south of our border here in Mexico. As I'm sure many of you are all too familiar with, the drug cartel-fueled violence in Mexico is completely out of control. It's a disaster. Um, far too many people are dying, especially at border towns like Ciudad Juarez. 
And one of the things that the Secretary of State and our ambassador to Mexico, Carlos Pascual, said is, you know what, we need to take a new and innovative approach to this. Let's get some people from Silicon Valley to help us think through in, in, in creative ways what we could do differently, what is something new we could do. And so we, so I and, and others were deployed down to Mexico to meet with the president's cabinet, to meet pe with people like Carlos Slim, to meet with leaders from civil society. And our goal was to come back with one idea uh, that could help reduce crime in Mexico. And so we came up with a program that is likely going to launch sometime in the fall um, based on what we learned down there, which was that the Mexican citizens themselves will no longer report crime, by and large, because they're afraid that if they walk up the literal or proverbial steps of the station house to, to um, report crime, they're going to get found out and will therefore be in danger. One of the things we learned while we were down there is everybody, even in the lowest income barrios in places like Ciudad Juarez, they all have cell phones and they all text message like crazy. So we've set up a program where people are going to be able to anonymously text message, and I could explain how that works, but that's not the best use of this time. Just take for, take for granted, I'm telling the truth, people will be able to anonymously text message uh, crime reports that will then compel the security forces to be on site with ten, within 10 minutes. Um, so what we're trying to do with this program is to restore anonymity, transparency, and accountability back into crime fighting in Mexico. And we don't yet know if that'll work, just like when we launched the Text Haiti program, we didn't know what the results for that will be, but we're very hopeful. So these are, these are just two very quick examples of some of the kinds of things that we're trying to do um, in a very innovative and very non-traditional way um, in sort of the fusty old world of, of diplomacy. But I wanted to sort of turn to um, the lessons that I've learned, uh, having been an entrepreneur, having built an organization from a basement into a pretty successful global organization, having been a part of a campaign that really went from startup mode to, revolution, to helping revolutionize the way that, that um, people thought about innovation policy and how campaigns are run to now in the State Department thinking about how innovation can help change diplomacy. And those four, again, are manage time like you manage money, hire true believers, stay connected, and stay out of the gray twilight. So briefly on each of those, number one, manage time like you manage money. So think about the amount of effort that entrepreneurs spend thinking about the allocation of capital and the effort that they put into managing their money. That and building their product are the, are the two most important things that they do, right? Well, one lesson that I would learn, that I've learned, that I think any entrepreneur must learn if she or he is going to be successful is that just as important as managing your capital is managing your time. Um, you know, and this is something that took me a long time to get right. You know, from age 22 to about 30, it was something that I struggled with. And I used to go through this exercise, um, you know, beginning when I was about 30, where I would take my calendar out and I would look at what I was doing six months ago or nine months ago, and I would literally go day by day and appointment by appointment and see what I was doing. And it made me want to, like, crawl into the fetal position. Um, to see all of these things that I thought were worthwhile and important and worth doing at the time and to realize after, after the fact that, my gosh, I spent a lot of time working on things that ended up just being losses. And so what I would argue to you is that as much time as you put, as much effort as you put into figuring out how you're going to manage your capital becomes similarly focused, similarly ruthless about how you manage your time because just as, as dollars drain out of your checking account, so too does time pass. And time is one of the most precious resources for an entrepreneur. Number two, hire true believers. There are a lot of smart people. 
and there's certainly a lot of smart people in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that I've come to believe is that as people are building their teams, entirely too much emphasis is placed on sort of the conventional notion of what appropriate qualifications are. You know, oh, this person has a, a master's from this school, let's hire him instead of the person that has a master's from this school, which isn't quite as good. Oh, this person has 10 years experience as opposed to this person's five years experience. You know, I think that that is a wildly overrated measurement for how to build your team. Um, you know, certainly as you become, as, as, as companies go from being big to being really big, I would argue that that's an appropriate time to really get very deep into the skill sets that you're trying to, to build. But if you're an early stage company, if, you know, looking out among this audience and seeing a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, what I would counsel you to do is focus on hiring people who would run through a brick wall, um, who are true believers in the mission of your organization, in the product or service. Because even if somebody isn't as smart as another, qual as another applicant, even if somebody isn't necessarily as well qualified as another applicant, in my own experience, it's people who have the will and hunger to succeed that more likely than not are going to be the ones who end up becoming most successful. And I just, I repeatedly see this happening. And what's interesting is that five years after the fact, everybody presumes that they're the smartest, most talented, most experienced people. But especially when you're building a business, the thing that I would most measure is not necessarily the amount of experience or even the IQ of the person who you are evaluating, but the level of passion that they're going to bring. Number three, stay connected. What do I mean by that? So I'm at this really weird point in my career where a lot of my peers are suddenly very important and very powerful. And it's been very interesting for me to see them and others as people ascend in their career, the degree to which people stop engaging with young innovators younger people. You know, I, 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 th I think that there's a lot of earnestness um, among young entrepreneurs, among people who are newly successful to say, oh, I want to stay connected. I want to mentor young people. I want to make sure that, you know, I keep it real and stay grounded and, you know, pay attention to the innovations that are taking place in the proverbial garages. And what oftentimes happens is that only lives rhetorically. I would argue, among most successful people. And I have absolutely no doubt, by virtue of the educations that, that many of you are getting right now, that you will be successful. And what's, what I think is going to be interesting for many of you is, once you're successful, do you focus all of your attention um, on managing up, getting to know more similarly successful and impressive people and, and staying amidst them? Or can you, will you stay grounded and make a priority out of spending time with young people and young innovators? Um, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, there are many one-hit wonders. There are many people who have, have enjoyed success one time. I would argue that people who have founded and built two great companies, what oftentimes distinguishes the entrepreneur who has built two great companies versus one great company is that that person who's built two great companies has managed to, to keep conversations going, to ma has managed to stay connected with people who are no longer their peers. And if you even think about, you know, the conference circuits, if you think about um, the social milieu, that people who are suddenly powerful, who are suddenly rich, are pulled into, it distances you from young innovators. And I would argue that people who mindfully or less mindfully isolate themselves from young people and from young innovators are more likely than not not going to have that second big success. 
And the fourth piece of advice that I wanted to pass along before opening this up to questions and answers is to stay out of the gray twilight. What do I mean by that? So the, there's a sentence, there's a line by Theodore Roosevelt that I'll repeat. That's, it's the third most important sentence I've ever read in my life. The first two were written by my wife. Yeah. Number one was, I love you. Number two was, I'm pregnant. <laughs> so my piece of advice to you goes to number three. And Theodore Roosevelt in 1899 said, far better to dare mighty things to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by defeat, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. And I would argue that there's a lot of gray twilight out there. There's a lot of comfort to be had by people getting good jobs, but by a wariness to take the, the bold step um, and to dare mighty deeds and to win glorious triumphs, but then to have similarly big failures. A and what I've learned is that failure isn't the end of the world. And in fact, it makes you a lot stronger. And I think that success in this world has to do with the spirit of audacity. You've got to be audacious and not care so much if you win or lose or, or to fling yourself into things, mind, body, and soul. And more likely than not, even if you lose, you're going to have fun and you're going to learn from it. And the people who I've gotten to know who are now you know, several steps past you in your lives, people in their, you know, my age bracket in their mid and late 30s, people in their 40s and people in their 50s, if you ask them oftentimes what it is that they regretted, it's that they regretted not taking some of those big chances. So the last piece of advice that I'll give to you just as many of you begin your careers is to stay out of the, the gray twilight. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, some questions for the next 20 minutes or so. Yes. Oh. Yes. I'll give you a couple of softballs to start off with. Okay. Um, can you talk about the complications of um, of dealing with China on technology and internet policy, uh, given the uh -huh. many sides of U.S. relations with China? And number two is. People like Howard Schmidt and a report out of, I can't remember if it's the National Science Foundation or the National Academies, people who ostensibly know what they're talking about say it's a sort of an open secret that the U.S. has developed offensive uh, cyber warfare capabilities. And uh, uh, I feel like I'm back in Washington with the <laughs> diplomatic press corps. Yeah. So let me answer that. So in terms... It's a really bad idea that they're secret because that's a, w a sure way to lose and it's not democratic. So I feel like I'm in the, uh, in, in the Brady press room. Um, so let me answer that. So in terms of our interactions with China on, on cyber policy, this is something where the secretary obviously has gotten, has, b has been very plain spoken. Um, there's an, an issue called internet freedom, which we define to mean the right to access, the freedom to access the internet, the websites of one's choosing, and each other. And internet freedom, you know, you take for granted in a place like Palo Alto that the web is built on this end user to end user principle that anybody can connect to whomever they want without intermediation in the middle of that. That's what allows people to communicate and collaborate in real time. It's what allows capital to flow with the click of a mouse. But it's increasingly the case that that isn't true around the world. And as I've said in the past, 2009 was the worst year in history in terms of internet freedom. And while countries like Iran and China get all of the attention on this issue, and while they suck up all of the oxygen, one of the things that I think is very important to understand and be aware of is that there are actually now dozens of countries from 
Thailand, to Turkey, to Vietnam, and many, many others who now view the internet as something that um, can be censored, something that can be built on something other than the end user to end user principle that so many of us and certainly everybody here in Silicon Valley cherishes. And so in terms of our engagement with the Chinese, you know, we've been very forward, forward with them about some of the differences that we've had on this issue. The Secretary of State gave a, a paradigm shifting speech on January 21st uh, where she spoke bluntly to some of the differences um, that we have with the Chinese on this. I will say that I think that demographics are destiny. There are about 400 million Chinese online right now, 200 million of whom are under the age of 25. And if I had to guess, I would guess that those 200 million Chinese under 25 who are currently online, that number is going to grow far larger. And I bet that the push from that demographic, particularly as it gets older and as it gets more empowered, it too will demand from its government the ability to access an uncensored internet. As to the second point in your question, I'm not going to you know, comment about any comments that um, you know, other government officials have made. I'll let you know, Mr. Schmidt speak for himself. Um, yes, Tina. So uh, you talked about the value of taking on big audacious goals and mm -hmm. being willing to fail. Have you had any uh, big failures that uh, you've learned from and experienced? You know, I haven't had any failures where, like, my company failed. Um, certainly, there were initiatives at my nonprofit um, that we thought were going to be a big deal that just thudded. You know, it's really interesting the degree to which things that you think are going to be successful fizzle, and some of the things that you think are promising turn out to be big. So just like the example that I used with the Text Haiti example, um, you know, there's an example of something that I think we had modest hopes for what it could do, but it turned out to have this big impact. And what it's now doing far more significantly than just the $35 million that the Red Cross now has to do earthquake relief is little nonprofits all around the country are now saying, well, hey, maybe we can't raise $35 million um, in $10 increments over cell phones, but maybe we can raise $35,000. You know, so it's, it's interesting. If you think, you know, I guess you all are too young to, to be at this point yet, but, you know, for, for myself and many others, we're used to getting, you know, things by snail mail, you know, from charities, you know, with sort of the heartfelt letter and, uh, and, uh, and a return address where they ask for 25 bucks. So the, the interesting impact of the Text Haiti program is it now is encouraging charities to rethink that model and think about how they can do uh, mobile giving programs. Yes, in the back. What do you think is the to creating innovation, innovative change in government? And, uh, and is one sector of government more innovative or more accessible to innovation than others? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that there are a couple big inhibitors to innovation in government. Uh, one is uh, statute and regulation. So what that means are you know, basically the rules that we have to follow. Um, when I was at my nonprofit, if I wanted to hire a particular web design firm because I thought they were the best web design firm, you know, I could hire them. Now, if we want to hire a web designer, we have to go through an elaborately formal process, which more often than not means that we can hire somebody in six months who has five people who they can dedicate to filling out an application. Um, who may not be the best um, to do the job, but who's the lowest bidder. So the, way the system is set up, up to not always um, be able to move fast, not be able to be flexible. And I would argue it actually prejudices against smaller companies and more innovative companies. That's one. Uh, challenge number two is you've got to have support at the top of these organizations to sort of force innovation and change through a bureaucracy. So in my case, I've been very lucky. First, you, you know, my association with the Obama campaign, you know, in that case, we had a candidate and we had campaign leadership that was very supportive of, first from a policy area, which is what I worked on, being, you know, very innovative and aggressive in terms of our technology and innovation policies, but secondly, 
you know, thinking about, they were, v they were very supportive from the top about what, how technology could revo revolutionize campaigning. Now at the State Department, you know, it's the Secretary of State is really the godmother of 21st century statecraft, and she, above anybody else, has been aggressive and smart and supportive of how innovation can be integrated into our statecraft. If you take her out of the equation, like if she's not Secretary of State, you know, I and my colleagues will, would have enjoyed, you know, 10% of the success that we did over the, past, over the past year. So you've got to have that leadership from the top driving this. And that's not universally the case. You know, it's not always the case that you have somebody at the top of an organization who's saying, I get it, I want to drive this, let's, let's push this hard. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, have you looked for other ways of innovation, innovation in foreign policy than technology? Uh, I'm sorry, say that. Have you looked for other ways of innovating or innovations in foreign policy than uh, those using technology? Uh, that I mean, is like or is not? Conceptual innovations or something not. like that? Is not using technology. Yeah, yeah. so it's interesting. Um, you know, techno innovation obviously is, is something that's about much more than technology. Um, so one of the things that, w I'll give you one example. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, in the innovation space that isn't technology specific is aid coordination. Now that is, is not at all a sexy topic, but it's actually incredibly important. And I was, I, and it's interesting, I was in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo um, about six months ago. And it, it, was, it was a fascinating experience. You know, the Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the poorest places on earth. It has a, a per capita GDP of $184. So $184 per person per year. So literally 50 cents of economic output per person per year. And it has this horrible history of colonialism and of outside interference inside the, inside the country. And I was there and amidst the poverty and amidst the squalor and amidst the, the violence that was there, there were a whole host of philanthropic efforts you know, from the United States government, from the British government, from the Belgian government, from the EU, and then from big foundations, and then from wealthy individuals. And none of it was connected in a way that made any sense whatsoever. And so one of the innovations that we're trying to bring um, into our development policies by way of illustration is thinking about how to do aid coordination in a new and different way. And again, that's not terribly sexy, but if you're looking at something that can actually be particularly meaningful, that would be good. And especially if you think about it um, transnationally. So the United States and, and the Chinese, for example, have very different uh, development policies in Africa. So China oftentimes is very focused on um, big infrastructure projects. And the United States historically has been focused on the provision of service. So the Chinese are building roads and we're helping support hospitals and healthcare networks. And so just one very, it seems obvious, but it's not anything that we've done, is say to the Chinese, hey, let's make sure that we build our hospitals where you're building your roads. Seems incredibly obvious, but decades have passed without, any, without coordination. So there's one example. Other questions? Yes. Since uh, you arrived at the State Department um, following Condoleezza Rice's departure, has it been an evolution or a revolution within the State Department with respect to technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to, this is going to sound like a cop out, but it has the virtue of being true, both. So let me, let me give some history to this. I, I would argue that What's happened over the, is since Secretary of State Clinton became Secretary of State has been revolutionary in nature and spectacular in terms of a very fast impact. However, the roots for this, I would argue, actually go back to the beginning of 2008. There's an interesting story. Um, you know, 21st century statecraft, as we think about it, 
really has its origins in February of 2008, where a Stanford graduate, a guy named Jared Cohen, if most of you, since you're still in school, I don't know if you're getting Stanford Magazine yet, but if you are, there's an article about my colleague Jared in there. One of the, thi one of the things that happened in February of 2008 was there was this movement, uh, A Million Voices Against FARC, the, the FARC terrorist organization in Colombia. And there were demonstrations by 12 million people in 190 different cities around the world. And following those demonstrations, the FARC saw more demobilizations in a couple weeks than had happened in the previous decade in terms of uh, military action. And so the State Department was like, how did this happen? Who's the leader? Who's behind all this? And so what they learned was that it was largely leaderless, that it was started by an unemployed uh, engineer in Colombia named Oscar Morales who just set up a page you know, a million voices against FARC. And what was interesting is, you know, this young Stanford graduate, he's 28 years old now, um, went down to Columbia, and he really began to investigate, at that point, the intersection between social media uh, and foreign policy. And so what then happened over the course of 2008 were a was a growing recognition within the State Department in the beginning of an understanding of the role of connection technologies in our foreign policy. And then when Secretary of State, uh, when, when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, then boom, it sort of exploded. And she began to allocate resources to it. And, you know, things like A Million Voices Against FARC, which is relatively recent, just a little over two years ago, now that thing, now that dynamic uh, is commonplace. Yeah. Yes. So you spoke a little bit earlier about empowerment. Um, so I was wondering what the State Department is doing to help stimulate innovation in third world countries if, if an entrepreneur there has a really great idea. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a couple examples. One, um, President Obama actually just convened a summit in April uh, focused on entrepreneurship uh, in Muslim communities. And I think that's a good model. So if you, th if you think about environments that are prone to radicalization, um, they oftentimes are places as, you know, third world, high concentrations of poverty. And thinking in this case about what we could do in Muslim communities, one of the thi things that we realized that we could do that would have the, the greatest impact is, is foster entrepreneurship. And so as a very practical matter, you know, what do, you, what do we have to offer? We have money, we have tools, and we have people. Um, and so the key for us is to, to put all three to work. So in terms of money, uh, a lot of what we're doing is, is focusing our development agenda uh, in places using market-based instruments um, to foster entrepreneurship in some experimental ways, taking some kinds of chances that historically haven't been the case. Um, you know, it's, it, there's this thing called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC. And for this initiative um, that's focused on Muslim communities and Muslim entrepreneurship, they're dedicating, I think it's literally a couple hundred million dollars um, in debt and equity financing um, into places where historically and into entrepreneurs where historically the United States government just wouldn't have put money in there. So that's one thing. Another thing is a focus on what are those things that can be done to support innovation and entrepreneurship given sort of the new layer of personal infrastructure that, that exists in the developing world. Uh, when I, on my first day of work in April of 2009, there were an estimated 4.1 billion mobile handsets on the planet. Today, you know, a little over a year later, there are 4.7, 4.8 billion mobile handsets on the planet. So literally in just one year, there's been a more than 10% increase. And with that increase of more than a half a billion handsets, 75% of those, 75% of those are in the developing world. So the challenge that we're putting to ourselves right now is, okay, if we're now past the tipping point, it's, it's sort of like we're, we are tipping in the tipping point right now, 
where people in the Congo and people in Malawi, people in Bangladesh, people the world around, even people of low incomes, have access to increasingly powerful smartphones? How can that be used to do more than make phone calls? And so it's sort of chapter one, page one. You know, right now, where we are, you know, our, our USAID administrator has only been in place for a handful of months. Um, and that is really the development wing of the American government. So what there is right now is there's a big strategy being developed through what we call, this is sort of bureaucratic speak, the Quadrennial Diplomatic and Development Review. What that means is figuring out where our money and efforts are going to go for the next four years. And this is a big chunk of it, is to say, you know, what are things that we can do that are empowering, that are based on this personal infrastructure that most people now have, you know, you know, riding on their, on their belts. A um, couple last questions. Uh, Chris Peacock. Now, in a big, long organization like State, how do you get people to think about innovation? <coughs> yeah, so, bang on the door and say, here I am. Well, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, part of it is just use the tools of the digital age. So, for example, this lecture I'm giving to, you know, I could look out and say I'm giving it to about 100 people but I'm told that the podcast will reach about 10,000. So part of it, is, it sounds trite, but part of it is trying to figure out how we can use digital communications to reach people at the embassy in Angola, at the embassy in Bangladesh, at the embassy in Vietnam, who couldn't necessarily sit in the auditorium at the corner of 21st and C Street in Washington, D.C. So that's thing one. The second thing is, you know, the State Department and foreign policy generally is still a hierarchical place. And so what the Secretary of State says and does matters a lot. You know, people are still used to, you know, hearing things from the top and then integrating that into their life because they've heard it from the top. Um, and so another way we do it is, is this is something that the Secretary has made a, a priority of, and she talks about it. So when she goes to places, she talks about the value and virtue of, of innovation and what she is personally doing, what the State Department is doing to support it. Um, so that's important. And in terms of how that then can be transferred, because this shouldn't all be just about what's in the best interest of the United States, but what's in the best interest of the world around. So when she sits down with um, her peers in a bilateral or multilateral setting, you know, she now raises these issues. She talks about innovation. You know, it now seems to many people like a long time ago, but when we all came into government, the financial crisis was something that it didn't matter that we were working in foreign policy. It was still something, something that was completely upending um, all of our point of view. And one of the things that the president recognized, and which we're trying to now be supportive of in our foreign policy, is that if there's going to be a le if we are going to regain the kind of global prosperity that we want and need it's not going to be because of um, asset building in real estate it's not going to be because of some fancy new financial instruments it's going to be because of innovation it's going to be because people have built new things, built new products, built new processes that create value, that help people live better, healthier, wealthier lives than they did before. So innovation, forgetting about our foreign policy for a moment, for a moment innovation is really at the core of, of our economic future. And so that's something that the President has prioritized and the Secretary of State has duly noted. So that's, that's another big push here. And, and even though the economy is improving right now, to not forget about that um, as we try to do, as we try to steward smart economic policies. Yes. So one more from a student. One more. Yep. Um, I have a question on the topic of creating value and uh, being innovative about Teach for America, about mm -hmm. your experience there. Just, uh, I, I've heard a, a lot of educational bigwigs, bigwigs in educational policy, criticize Teach for uh, Teach for America for uh, employing underqualified candidates for periods of time that are too short for them to make an actual lasting difference in the communities that they choose to serve. 
And so I wanted to know if you agreed with this perspective and if you did or did not, what, what kind of reforms Teach for America could institute to preserve the fundamental integrity and value of the program whilst making the best of their applicant pool, which is very yep. talented and youthful and energized? Yeah, so let me answer that in two ways. Number one, that assertion is factually inaccurate. <coughs> so there's actual data, and data actually tells a pretty good story. And so if you actually look at, at the study, you know, if you actually look at studies that show first year teachers going into, you know, the specific kinds of environments that Teach for America teachers are going, are going into, what you now see is that the retention levels are oftentimes equal to or better than um, traditionally trained first year teachers who go into these kinds of schools. So that's thing one. So, you know, I think that that assertion oftentimes is made by education professionals who resent um, the innovation oftentimes that is the, the sort of the non-traditional um, point of origin of Teach for America. The second way that I would answer it is by saying even among those teachers who do leave the classroom, a lot of what they do, again looking at the data, um, a lot of what they do, even if they aren't in the classroom anymore, it's still doing things that um, are very focused on education in underprivileged environments. So, you know, I, for example, I left the classroom and what I chose to do was start a nonprofit, the purpose of which was to help kids um, growing up in poor communities. And that's a trend that um, I and the research increasingly shows, which is that even those Teach for America teachers who are leaving the classroom, um, you know, historically, maybe these people would have gone to Goldman Sachs or to McKinsey or to any of a variety of other things. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But a huge percentage of those people are becoming assistant principals. They're becoming principals. They're going to think tanks. They are becoming, law they're becoming lawyers, but they're becoming public interest lawyers. Or, like me, they start a nonprofit and then go into public service. I think I've got time for one more question. Yes. Sort of related. Can you talk a little bit about um, the policies of the state um, regarding innovation or in encouraging innovation in the education sector? Yeah, so, um, so when you say in the state, do you mean at the State Department specifically? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, so, so the State Department is not the historic locus for education policy within the American government. Um, but what, you know, I will, I will point out two things. Um, number one, what's happening right now at the U.S. Department of Education um, under the leadership of Secretary of Education Arne Duncan is pretty remarkable. Um, and, you know, I read something recently where it described what President Obama and Secretary of Education Duncan are doing is very similar to, uh, very similar to what Richard Nixon did sort of opening the gates into China. It took a staunch anti-communist like Richard Nixon to have the credibility to be able to open up our relations with China. So too, it took an urban superintendent like Arne Duncan and somebody who has as obvious a commitment to urban education as Barack Obama to say, you know what, this is a problem that involves more than just adding dollars to it. You know, let's take away the firewall that exists between students' uh, educational performance and teacher evaluation. You know, that might seem obvious to a smart young person like yourself, but that historically has been a firewall that you absolutely couldn't cross. In terms of the State Department and in terms of the United States' role promulgating policies like that abroad, you know, I think this is a case where a little bit of humility is called for. You know, I'm, I'm, nobody's a prouder American than I am, and, you know, I'll beat my chest about all of those things that I think we do best and that I think we can do to empower citizens the world around. But you know what? I think we can learn a thing or two about math education ourselves from people in Singapore. You know, I think we can learn a lot about public education from public education systems from outside of the United States. So while I and while we as Americans, I think we have a unique and important role given our glo global leadership to assert ourselves 
in a variety of ways. I also think that on a couple things, a little bit of humility is called for. And while I think that, that President Obama and Secretary of Education, are do, uh, Education um, Duncan are doing spectacular things, before we get on our high horse and start evangelizing for the way that America does public education, you know, I'm personally of the point of, my, of, the point of view that we're still in a good point where we, we could do a little bit more listening than talking. So with that, thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Oh, thank and you. Uh, yeah, on behalf of uh, DFJ, STVP, and BASIS, we'd like to present you with this trophy. Oh, and thank, uh, you. You know, thank you again for coming to speak here. <laughs> we appreciate it. It was very inspiring. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.